Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to this first of our three sessions on the topic nonviolence, the tactics and strategies of winning campaigns. Today, as you know, we focus on Gandhi's classic nonviolent campaign against the British in 1930. And the question we pose, what can we learn from this campaign about winning campaigns today? So my name is Richard Sandbrook, and I'm from Science for Peace. And this series is a co-production of Signs for Peace and Voice of Women for Peace. And I'd like to acknowledge as well the important support we've received from our endorsers, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom Canada, Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, the Winnipeg Peace Alliance, Nonviolence International, and Conscience Canada. So the issue is, can we learn from historical experiences? Now, our three cases, including the one today on Gandhi's Salt March, are all interesting in their own terms. But we hope that this session and the ones to follow will also be useful. Today, as we all know, we confront what is sometimes called a pluri crisis, including global warming, species extinction, the threat of nuclear exchange, and the rise of anti-democratic, far-right, nativist parties worldwide. In this context of these kind of massive issues, it's easy, so easy for individuals to give up, including that really nothing can be done about such massive issues. But here is the hope. We do have the numbers. If we understand the ingredients of success in past campaigns, we can perhaps apply that wisdom to current campaigns and win. So the question is, how can we use our numbers together with effective nonviolent tactics and conventional electoral politics to win important victories and build a human future? We have a responsibility to at least try. So we on the committee see these three historical sessions as the beginning, not the end of the venture. With your support, we hope to mount later on face-to-face -face training sessions on nonviolent action in Toronto, together with virtual and live sessions on contemporary campaigns, such as focusing on global warming or pertaining to a local issue, such as blocking intrusions into the green belt surrounding outside of Toronto. Our approach in this series is to engage in a dialogue with you, not to tell you things so much as to discuss the issue with you. So we begin with a 25 minute documentary and uh, we then invite you to share your reactions to this documentary, including what, what feelings surfaced as you were watching the film. What do you think was a significant tactic employed by Gandhi. Would that tactic work in campaigns today, do you think? To assist in our thinking through this campaign, we have a facilitator and an expert. Uh, the facilitator is Lynn Adamson, who has uh, spent her life professionally as a mediator and conflict resolution uh, person. And she is also a longtime peace and climate activist and trainer in nonviolent action. The expert is Bill Banaji, who is the author of a book on Gandhi and a founding member of the Global Institute for Non-Killing. So we invite you to join our discussion and please use the hands up sim symbol, you know, the hands up symbol, which is down the bottom of your, your screen under reactions, uh, if you want to make a comment or reflection. At that point, Melissa, who has the controls, will recognize you and unmute your microphone. Please keep your microphones muted until you do speak. Just one, one further preliminary matter. If you want to join our nonviolent working group, uh, no matter where you live, since we operate by Zoom, you are more than welcome. To join us, 
contact us at this email address, sfp at physics.utoronto.ca, or join, or join us via our website, which is at www.scienceforpeace.org. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the, the film, 25-minute documentary, and after that, Lynn will take over and begin to facilitate our discussion with, with, Bill, with Bill's assistance. So, Melissa, please begin the movie. Confined within the walls of a South African jail, the young lawyer from India found no reason to complain. Some say that jail is a palace. Others look upon it as a beautiful garden. Some others hold that through the jail gates, we shall pass from our present bondage to freedom. The year was 1907. The young lawyer from India was Mohandas Gandhi. Gandhi led his fellow Indians in a non-violent struggle against racial oppression for eight years. They marched into forbidden territory. They burned their registration papers. They expected to be arrested and they were not disappointed. Gandhi said, non-violent refusal to cooperate with injustice is the way to defeat it. He gave his non-violent weapon a name, Satyagraha, holding to truth. In every decade and on every continent, Underdogs have taken up Gandhi's strategies to fight for their rights and freedom. Nonviolence means fighting back, but you're fighting back with other weapons. The power that Gandhi discovered changed the 20th century. greatest colonial empire. Britain has ruled India for more than a century. But in 1930, the Viceroy, Lord Irwin, knows a crisis is coming. A confrontation in which British military might will count for little. Irwin's adversary is Mohandas Gandhi a man whose name is already a synonym for non-violent action. Since returning from South Africa, Gandhi has become his country's dominant political figure. He understands that control of India depends on Indian cooperation, not British coercion. He said, how can just 100,000 British troops control at that time over 300 and 50 million Indians, just 100,000 British troops. Gandhi said, we'll stop doing anything that the British want us to do. The whole nation will come to a standstill. Civil disobedience on a mass scale. Many Indians welcome the struggle. Gandhi must find a way to use their energy to maximum effect. Gandhi retires to his headquarters on the Sabarmati River, near India's west coast. In the ashram, the spiritual community where he lives, he turns inward in search of a non-violent strategy for freedom. For weeks, he is alone in his Spartan office. 
he gives no hint of his thinking. They even commented. Uh, Narayan Desai lived in Gandhi's ashram during those critical weeks. Some, some said, oh, he's a very clever man. He doesn't want the British government to know what uh, strategy he's going to take. And he would all the time say, no, I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for the call. And I know I will hear the inner voice. In February, he decides. He will begin by challenging the British tax and monopoly on salt. He writes the Viceroy, Lord Irwin, on March the 2nd. He explains the injustice of the salt laws and says he will go to the beach to make salt illegally. He will invite all Indians to do the same. He pleads with Irwin to negotiate. A few days later, a note from Irwin's secretary expresses the Viceroy's regret at Gandhi's plan of action. Gandhi sends advanced teams to choose a beach where civil disobedience will begin. In speeches and articles, he attacks the salt laws, emphasizing the injustice, especially to the poor. He knows that salt will be a powerful symbol. Every human being needs salt. Without salt, you and I can't exist. So he wanted to touch a chord in every Indian heart that here is something you and I and all of us need. Why should that be taxed? With a sharp instinct for political theater, Gandhi charts a route from his ashram to the sea. He and his volunteers will walk 240 miles. Being on the road for nearly a month, he believes, will build suspense and a bigger audience for his message. He expects to be arrested before he reaches the coast. At first light on March 12th, the great drama begins. At 60, Gandhi is the oldest of 78 marchers. Thousands join the procession including police observers. But the government makes no attempt to interfere. They feared that he was so popular that there may be a violent outbreak. So they weighed the advantages and disadvantages of arresting him. And they also underrated this movement, Salt Satyagraha. They felt it might fizzle out. And Gandhi looked ridiculous that uh, if he goes on marching and he does not commit any breach of the laws, we can't arrest him. What are we arresting him for? Gandhi wants to be arrested, but not too soon. The longer he marches, the more publicity he will receive. His messages are aimed equally at his immediate audience and the outside world, represented by dozens of journalists who have joined the march. In his speeches, he insists, we must not hate the British. They have not taken India from us. We have given it to them. Gandhiji, as I knew him as a schoolboy, was someone you admired, someone you looked up to, someone who was a saint. He was a saint because A, he dressed like a saint, and B, the things he said seemed to be very saintly. And on the other side, as I grew up, I began to see a very shrewd student of human history. He was a man who absolutely understood human psychology. He understood the British idea of fair play. He understood that and he knew how to play on that sentiment. Although the Crown never hesitates to use force, British administrators pride themselves on their enlightened rule and the cooperation they receive from Indian officials. Gandhi intends to remove Indian consent to foreign rule. The Salt March will create a dilemma. If they arrest him, 
all India will rise up in protest. If he is permitted to openly defy the law, British control will be lost, perhaps irretrievably. In every speech, Gandhi explains the power of non-violent resistance. He asks local leaders to quit their government jobs. When everyone refuses to cooperate, he says, the British will be able to do nothing. He was asking the village headmen to resign their posts. And I think 140 or so did resign. Why did he ask them to resign? It is a government, foreign government, running this country for their own benefit. And why should you serve it? Defying rumors that his health is failing, Gandhi sticks to his schedule. At every rest stop, he asks, how many local officials have quit their government jobs? How many villagers are wearing khadi, the handmade cotton cloth that is the informal uniform of his movement? Gandhi tells Indians not to buy imported cloth. He spins cotton for two hours every day to dramatize the millions of jobs lost to imported British cloth. Gandhi says, if every Indian will spin at the same time, the song of the spinning wheel will become the song of freedom. He gets by on four hours sleep. He must persuade thousands of volunteers to be arrested and go to jail, or his long march will end in failure. And here was a man who understood how to get the maximum exposure for his message. And in a sense, you can say he was one of India's greatest, uh, I hate to use the word, but within quotes, advertising men. And as he marched, long before Martin Luther King's march on Washington, Gandhiji was the originator of this. And as he marched and as he marched, people began to spread the word. He's on the march. He's going to defy the law. Let's join him. This is a chance to show the British without having to hit them, to show them that we stand for something. We are not just slaves. And by God, by God, even I, who was only a schoolboy at that time, I tell you, my hair stood on end when I realized he was slowly approaching the goal. And we all knew once he picked up that handful of salt, he would be arrested. On the 24th day, the marchers approach the sea. An American newspaper editorializes. As Britain lost America through tea, it is about to lose India through salt. On the eve of the law breaking, Gandhi meets on the beach with 12,000 supporters. Hold the salt in your fist, he suggests, and think it is worth 60 million rupees. That's how much the government has been taking from us through the monopoly on salt. At dawn on April 6th, Gandhi bends down and picks up a lump of mud and salt. that Gandhi has broken the salt law electrifies the country. Thousands march to the shore to follow his example. Jawaharlal Nehru, India's future prime minister, describes the mood. It seemed as though a spring had been suddenly released. <clears throat> All over the country, manufacture was the topic of the day. It was immaterial whether the stuff was good or bad. The main thing was to commit a breach of the obnoxious salt law, and we were successful in that. This tremendous success of Salt Satagra 
was not foreseen by the British. There are many skeptics who thought Salt Satyagraha what? You can't unseat the king emperor by boiling sea water in a kettle. So that was the assumption. But in a non-violent struggle, it is the insight of the leader which matters, you know. What will mobilize the people? What will make them feel that they have a cause to fight for? And what will make them fight it non-violently? As his movement engulfs the country, Gandhi is surprised he's not been arrested. Visiting seaside villages, he encourages civil disobedience, which he says is only the beginning. Today we are defying the salt law. Tomorrow we shall have to consign other laws to the waste paper basket. We shall practice such non-cooperation that finally it will not be possible for the administration to carry on. When you are non-violent, how do we tackle you? How do, you? how do we meet your challenge? At the most, we can imprison you. And if we imprison you again, you become more popular. You can't, we can't use arms against you. We can't use violence against you. So here is a person who has evolved a technique which uh, overpowers the British. From the government in New Delhi, Lord Irwin cables London. The personal influence of Gandhi threatens to embarrass the administration. And in some areas, he has already undermined government authority. Gandhi's headquarters are on the beach. A month after he picked up the first lump of salt, he announces an escalation. He and his volunteers will seize the government salt works at the nearby town of Darasana. Near midnight on May 4th, he writes to Lord Irwin, offering three ways to stop the raid on the salt works. End the salt tax. Arrest the raiding party. Or break their heads. He finishes the letter and retires for the night. By the next morning, Gandhi is behind bars. He is delighted. The arrest sets off a firestorm. In city after city, normal life comes to a standstill. Lord Irwin announces a strategy of steady pressure. Police are to use minimum force. Irwin issues emergency ordinances. Political meetings are prohibited. The press is censored. The Indian National Congress Working Committee is banned. Irwin's plan to avoid repression fails as the new ordinances provide new opportunities for law-breaking. Thousands are arrested. Exactly what Gandhi wants. A batch of policemen came to arrest my father. And uh, some of us young children were following the police van. And instead of saying bye-bye, uh, papa, or something like that, I was telling him, papa, this time, no less than two years, which means I want you to be in prison for no less than two years. You see, it was a, it was a pride to have your father uh, uh, sentenced for two years, and not for three months or so. So Gandhi's idea is what had touched even the children in that atmosphere. Gandhi's raid on the Darasana salt works goes forward without him. A well-known poet, Sarojini Naidu, leads the siege. She instructs her army. You must not use violence under any circumstances. You will be beaten, but you must not resist. You must not even raise a hand to ward off the blows. 
after 10 days of skirmishing, 2,500 demonstrators confront the guards head on. Police attack the Satyagrahis with steel-tipped clubs called latis. A United Press reporter, Webb Miller, witnessed the scene. They went down like ten pins. I heard the sickening wax of the clubs on unprotected skulls. Those struck down fell, sprawling, unconscious, or writhing with pain, with fractured skulls or broken shoulders. Miller's report is published in nearly 2,000 newspapers and read aloud in the U.S. Senate. One Satyagrahi explained. Our object was to show the world at large the fangs and claws of the government in all its ugliness and ferocity. In this, we have succeeded beyond measure. In midsummer, the struggle is undiminished. Even with Gandhi and most nationalist leaders in prison, government has effectively lost control of major cities. Press reports of police brutality damage the British cause almost as much as the resistance campaign. Irwin cables the governor of Bombay. I am sure these Lati charges are exactly what our enemies want. We should be racking our brains for a way to deny them this advantage. In July, government reports nearly 17,000 civil resistors have been arrested. Gandhi's goal of filling the jails is more than self-sacrifice. It is mass disobedience and is steadily eroding British authority. If an authority enjoys power, he enjoys power to the extent to which obedience is rendered. But moment the obedience goes off, moment the laws are disobeyed, moment the command of the powerful are not obeyed, your power vanishes. Those who can't endure the hardships of jail can still help in the fight, boycotting or picketing shops which sell British goods. When sales suffer, Lord Irwin issues a Prevention of Intimidation Ordinance against picketing. The result? More arrests, as bystanders cheer. British trade with India drops 25%. And in December, three out of four foreign cloth shops are closed. By January, the British Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald, sees that negotiations are the only way to end the standoff. He orders Gandhi and the other leaders released. The national movement remains strong as Gandhi's release is celebrated. But the commander knows his foot soldiers need a rest. On February the 14th, he informs Lord Owen that he is ready to negotiate. He insists that salt making and boycotts will continue during the talks. At the Viceroy's palace in New Delhi, Gandhi is the first Indian ever to meet with a British ruler as an equal. Negotiations last three weeks. Irwin refuses to give ground on the salt laws and cloth imports, concessions which would alienate his Indian collaborators. Gandhi secures the release of political prisoners and the lifting of repressive ordinances. He calls off civil disobedience. Constitutional issues are pushed back for later talks in London. There were many people who were not satisfied. They thought that perhaps Gandhi compromised 
and perhaps went out of his way. But Gandhi's argument always was that this movement is not in vain because it is through such movements that is training people that you can't have everything at one stroke. You compromise, you gather your strength, you train yourself and then take the next step. A year after the Salt March, India remains under British rule. But Gandhi has ended the pretense of British legitimacy in India. By exposing injustice and ending Indians' consent to foreign rule, he has awakened the people to their own power and set India on the road to independence. Britain grants Indian independence 16 years later, in 1947. Within a year, Gandhi is dead of an assassin's bullet. Far beyond his accomplishments in India, his vision and his practice of non-violent conflict have set an example for future generations. He had once said, my technique of non-violent struggle is in the same stage as electricity in Edison's time, to be refined and developed. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us for the film screening. My name is Lynn Adamson, um, co-chair of Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, also a board member of Science for Peace. And right now, what we'd like to do is give you an opportunity to uh, share observations that you might have had from the film. So what were the strategies or tactics that you saw using? Just pick one, you know, and we'll, we'll hear from different people. Um, that contributed to this being a winning campaign. We'll just do this for about 10 minutes or so, and then Bill Benicia will share some observations and comments with you all. So um, just raise your hand uh, using the reaction button, and uh, I'll take them in the order that I see them. Okay, so I see Anna. Um, you've got a comment, um, an observation? Mm -hmm. Sheer numbers. Um, oh, I liked seeing Lech Valenza there. The Solidarity Movement had a little clip, and um, just sheer numbers uh, being being. Um, I forget what it was in India, but a hundred thousand um, military against five million. Three hundred and fifty million. Three hundred fifty million. Yep. Thank you. So numbers, that's one uh, contributing factor. Um, do we have others who would like to make an observation? Um, what did you notice that Gandhi did that was effective? Um, you know, one thing I noticed is he, uh, he took a month to get to the, um, the salt uh, place where he was going to make salt. And so he was building up suspense. Uh, the whole time what was going to happen uh, while he built visibility and the numbers. Okay, but next we have Elizabeth. Okay, uh, one of the things he was walking and uh, I know when the, um, <clears throat> they came from Ontario, I believe in Northern Ontario or something, there's some, the chiefs of an uh, indigenous group were seeking justice from Ottawa. So they walked and they walked and they walked. And as they walked through villages, more of their own different nation, indigenous nations came together. And by the time they got to Ottawa, they were quite big, large, but nobody was there to meet them, which means that Canada's um, they walked all that way, some really old elders, some you know, it was quite incredible. It was a few years ago, I remember it. And, but nobody was there to even acknowledge them. Somebody did in the end, but 
uh, in Canada, it's really hard. Like the Freedom Convoy did, but all those people had vehicles, they had money. They weren't, uh, they weren't just ordinary people, as you say, like those people were, were used to walking. So they walked and walked and walked. Mm -hmm. and that is the only way you can actually, Terry Fox is a very good example of that. He walked, right, until he couldn't. And yep. he got a huge car, but he walked, um, he went right through Quebec before until he hit on, uh, until he got to Ontario. Okay. And that's when the, the, you know. Yep. That's basically. Okay, Elizabeth, I'm going to cut you off there. I'm going to hold you there because we just want to get a number, a number of tactics. The walking was important. Thank you for that. Uh, and mentioning the Indigenous using that uh, technique. I've got Lynn Ovenden next. Uh, he picked um, a complaint that everybody would have in the salt tax. Um, every, it was a thorn for everybody. I, I guess I'll add another one. He he really um, he picked a strategy that would attract the attention of the media, and the media responded so that the message spread. Thank you. Uh, strategic um, target very meaningful to people and uh, one that would attract the media. So media was important too. Um, thank you, Lynn. And Ian, I see your hand there. Yeah, I, um, I took quite a lot from this um, film. And one of, the, but one of the things I'd like to stress is that I thought that the self-discipline of Gandhi's followers was quite amazing. It, it really, why was it that a more violent faction did not seek to respond to the British troops. How was he able to secure that self-discipline of his supporters and ultimately achieve his objectives in that way? Okay, thank you. That was important, Ian, the self-discipline. And I know when um, a, a moment we might have a response about how he was able to achieve that. Uh, I'm gonna take Paul and Emily, and then I'm gonna hand things over to Bill Banija to share some observations and comments. Go ahead, Paul. One of the things that was impressive in all these campaigns is that he always said, do not hate the British. Mm -hmm. Do not hate the British. They are human beings like everyone else. We're not doing this against the British. We're doing this against the oppression. And in all the campaigns that we have now in the wars that are going on, the hardest thing to do is not to hate the adversary. That's what hit Thank me. You. Thank you, Paul. Emily. Well, the ultimate outcome was undermining le legitimacy, and which is and, and consciousness raising to me led to undermining the legitimacy because it wouldn't have been possible without raising consciousness. Mm hmm. Okay, so calling on people to think differently uh, about the situation that they were in, to think critically about that, right, um, was an important factor. Yes, or Correct. Emily, did you want yes. to add something? Yes. No, no, okay. that's, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for your observations of what you noticed in the film. Uh, we will uh, do the same thing on the other films, which we'll have uh we'll mention later there's another the same registration link i think works for um all of the film series and the next one is march 20th but right now i'm going to hand things over to bill benicia to share some observations and comments with all of us go ahead bill thanks len um the splendid film there the uh, lot of um answers are there in the film itself uh, in the script uh, and uh, you know, one of the questions was about how do how does one uh, pick up the uh, the cause to fight? And in the film, there's a one clip there where he says, "Oh, um, give me 24 hours or two three days. I'm going to meditate on it. I'm going to come up with something. I usually come up with something uh, to to make it that powerful that it." it would get the support of the master. Uh, well, coming back to the nonviolence, uh, which is depicted in the film, nonviolence is of two types. And uh, 
One is principled and other is pragmatic. And Gandhi's nonviolence is principled, it's ethical. It's, uh, uh, this is the one we saw uh, in the, this film as an example of principled nonviolence. And the result of Gandhi's Satyagraha principle steeped in ethics and moral values. Uh, Gandhi, is, and is, you see the same sort of values there in Tolstoy, in uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, Gandhi believed in that there was only one God, and that is truth. And uh, he said, truth is God, and it can be achieved only through nonviolence. And he used the Indian word for it, Sanskrit word, ahimsa, which uh, to him in the scriptures is the supreme dharma, uh, one's moral duty, that there's nothing higher than that, ahimsa parmo dharma. The beauty of Gandhi, as I say, is that he is constantly evolving. Uh, in his understanding of religion, race, or politics. In that way, he's open-minded, uh, and he is looking for ways to love and nonviolence to overcome the barriers that divide us. Uh, he's satisfied with incremental, small steps, but principled victories. Uh, and he describes his nonviolence way as a as structure literally meaning holding firmly to truth. And that truth, he calls his truth force, the soul force. And he is looking for followers who would believe in this, that. We see in the film, this documentary, uh, something Gandhi has been working for years. And it's not just one or two years, he started developing that concept of Satyagraha in South Africa for 11 years uh, before returning to India. And in South Africa, he used that principle for helping Indian indentured labor and small merchants to gain their human rights and dignity. And then he, his method is still evolving at that, uh, at that time. The math method of Satyagraha, the follow the truth and everything will be there for you eventually. Uh, and he tried that first in South Africa. He urged Indians to defy the new law and to suffer the punishments for doing so. And Gandhi's ideas of protest, persuasion skills and public relations, then by that time started emerging. And he took these back with him to India in 1915. And then on arrival in India, this is still 15 years before uh, the salt march. He is experimenting that with the, locally, on, on the local situations. Uh, trying to uh, help the exploited, the laborers, the peasants. Uh, he leads the strike of mill workers in Ahmedabad, leads successful Satyagraha campaign for rights of peasants on indigo dye plantations in Champaran in Bihar, a similar campaign to in refusal to pay taxes by peasants in Kheda region, hit by famine. Uh, I, I'm sure many of you probably know all that, but I'm just providing an overview there. The first all India Satyagraha campaign against the British rule is conceived in 1919. It is against the passage of Rural Act uh, that perpetuates withdrawal of civil liberties of Indian prestigious crimes. Uh, after the fire, uh, they have been fired upon in Punjab. Uh, and, and the second All India Satyagraha camp campaign is the salt tax refusal in 1930. So there are major gaps between those two. And he makes use of that time to organize. 
to get people together to think strategically and his training is all about discipline uh, so that there is a group of like-minded people uh, believing in something common uh, and both in terms of the what is to be achieved and how it has to be achieved. So, so the means and ends come together. Uh, so uh, as we can see, Gandhi did not conceive his Satyagraha idea in a single day or in a single moment. Uh, this is what already 22 years have passed and his last pre-independence or in the Satyagraha campaign uh, is around the time of Second World War. 1941-42, and Gandhi is opposed to providing any help to the British war effort, and he campaigns against any Indian participation. Gandhi's opposition to the Indian participation in the Second War is motivated by his belief that India could not be party to a war ostensibly being fought for democratic freedom while that freedom is denied to India itself. And as the war progresses, Gandhi intensifies his demand for independence with his uh, voluntary for, of uh, uh, his voluntary satirized, you know, uh, calling for British to quit India, uh, pronounced in a 1942 speech in Mumbai. So um, uh, this is uh, this was uh, this action uh, again brings lots of people into the imprisonment and these are thousands of people who are now arrested. Uh, uh, and, and all that leads to, he urges people to completely stop cooperating with the imperial government. And in this effort, he urges that they neither kill nor in, injure British people, but be willing to suffer and die if violence is initiated by British officials. And India gains independence on 15th August 1947. And few months later, he is assassinated from three bullets of a political Hindu fanatic on 30th January 1948. This is uh, my sketch of his life uh, as an activist. But in summary, to Gandhi, the power of nonviolence is not merely in his philosophy but its power is in practice. He says it cannot be preached. It has to be practiced. Uh, so, uh, and he puts himself, he puts non-violence to test before making attempts to organize it. Uh, in my travel to India in 2006, uh, I was interested in knowing uh, uh, what's did anybody follow Gandhi, you know, after all these years, that was 60 years later, what was the state and I, uh, of uh, people's response? Uh, and I, I wrote a short book, Request for Gandhi, A Non-Killing Journey, and I met activists, journalists, politicians, and, and I was surprised to see how much Gandhi had become part of the society even most of the people wouldn't know that it was, he had been uh, in, he had been there in everything there. Uh, so so um, I, I, I won't go further much much in it. But uh, in his autobiography, he mentions three obstacles to be overcome for India to achieve to achieve true freedom. One was one is Hindu-Muslim unity. Second was Elimination of untouchability as a part of caste system and emancipation of Indian women. And these were all three things which he confronted throughout his life. And he made sure that in Satyagraha movement, all these three things were mentioned that anybody who was uh, not supporting that uh, couldn't be a member of. Satyagraha movement. Uh, also, it's very. Uh, I have a couple of books here. Uh, a book written by Santi Sena, the Gandhi vision of a, a peace brigade and army, written by Dr. William Baskran, who is a professor 
at Gandhi uh, uh, Rural University in uh, near Madurai, and the training was used on the Gandhi's training way by Dennis August Almedia from, uh, I think, uh, he's from, previously from University of Hawaii. Uh, and uh, so what I found was that he proposed a series of rules for Satyagrahis to follow in a resistance campaign. So one was harbor low anger. Second, suffer the anger of the opponent. Third, never retaliate to assault or punishment, but do not submit out of the fear of punishment or assault to an order given in anger. Voluntarily submit to arrest or confiscation of your own property. If you are a trustee of property, defend that property from confiscation, confiscation with your life. Do not curse or swear. Do not insult the opponent. Neither salute nor insult the flag of your opponent or your opponent's leader. If anyone attempts to insult or assault your opponent, defend your opponent non-violently with your life. As a prisoner, behave courteously and obey prison regulations, except that any that are contrary to self-respect. As a prisoner, do not ask for special favorable treatment. As a prisoner, do not pass in an attempt to gain convenience. And finally, joyfully obey the orders of the leaders of the civil disobedience act. And he founded the uh, Sabramati Ashram to teach Satyagraha uh, in around the 1930s, uh, early 1930s. Uh, and there he asked his Satyagrahis to follow the following principles. Non-violence, that means non-injury in thought, words, and deed. Second, truth. This includes honesty, but goes beyond it to mean living fully in accord with and in devotion to that which is true. Not stealing. Number four, non-possession, which is not same as poverty. Number five, respect for body labor or bread labor. And number six, control of desires and space here, gluttony. Uh, fear, seven, fearlessness. Eight, equal respect for all religions. Nine, economic strategy, such as boycott of imported goods, such as Swadeshi. And he must have a living faith in God. And that's where I call him that uh, principle, uh, non-violent must be leading a safe life and be willing to die or lose all his possessions, must be a habitual uh, khadi weaver, home spinner, spun, weaving cloths and spinner, must obtain from alcohol and other intoxicants. So uh, for Gandhi, th th those are the basic uh, essentials. Uh, quest for truth is the core value of nonviolence. He believed that one can always improve one's knowledge of truth by constant effort. He maintained that one should hold on to the relative truth one has arrived at through sincere effort of hard work, experimentation, and sharing. But at the same time, there should be no end to such quest in the development and promotion of Satyagraha and personal and collective levels. So Gandhi's Satyagraha movement continues in India and elsewhere, being internalized, internalized and diverse ways over 35 years since its passing as a means of nonviolent social and political action by people at governments and governments at all levels. Thank you. I'll be glad to take more questions here. Next. Okay, well, now that there's time for anyone who would like to uh, make a comment or reflection to, uh, to raise your hand and uh, spend a few minutes doing that, if anybody wants to add to what we've said. Sorry, I've just lost my screen. I yeah, don't see any hands up um, at the moment, Richard. Um, okay. 
I did. I um, lost my, my screen, so I'm going to have to. Can you, can you hear me still? We can still hear you. Uh, yep. I'm afraid I have to go therefore without a screen. So. Uh, we have one hand. Do you see Anna? Yes, there's Anna. Would Thank you. Like you. To share? Yeah. Thank you, Bill Banerjee, for the speech and sharing your research. Um, I appreciate the summons to resisting anger. Uh, that's very effective. And can you repeat where the principles of conduct can be found? Uh, yes. Um, there's a, this book called Shanti Sena which is published in India, uh, but I'm sure I can, uh, it's 1999, by one Dr. William Baskaran. Uh, he's the professor uh, of uh, Peace Army there for Shanti Sena, uh, Conflict Resolution uh, at the Gandhi Gram. I, I can send later on to you uh, those, uh, the pointers I mentioned. Thank you. I have been struggling with the anger part. Uh, it's just a, a question about the uh, recording, Richard. Um, uh, I, I don't know if Melissa knows when we would have a recording available, but that is the plan to have a recording of this event available. Yes, let me just go to the, to the wrap up. I think I'm probably ready okay, for that. Okay, go ahead. And uh, first of all, let me thank Lynn and Bill for their um, promoting our, our, our discussion in the last uh, half hour. I'd also like to draw your attention to a, a film series on nonviolence, which the World Beyond War is um, sponsoring. It begins in about 10 days. There are three films there. there um, they're, they're viewing in their uh, film series. So if you want to know more about that, please go to the website of World Beyond War. Um, so I would like to spend just two or maybe three or four minutes summing up, uh, if I can, the um, essence of, the, of, of Gandhi's thought, as we've discussed it today, as we've seen it in the film, as it's relevant to today's um, campaigns. I think there are, for me, there are five, um, five important lessons that I would very briefly underline. First is that Gandhi understood the social basis of power. It was a fundamental um, discovery on his part. When he asked, how could it be that 100,000 British troops can control 350 million Indians? Of course, the answer was only because Indians obeyed, because they actually um, consented, in a sense, to the power of the British. So then Gandhi realized that if people simply refused to obey the dictates of uh, the Raj, then the uh, authority of the Raj would crumble. Secondly, of, of, of contemporary importance is that Gandhi understood his opponent. He understood how the British would respond. He he'd, uh, he'd lived in England, he'd become a lawyer, he lived in South Africa, then in India. He knew that the British um, would certainly arrest people, but they were unlikely to, to there to be deaths if, if they, there was this march to the, the, uh, to the seaside to illegally um, make, make salt. So understanding the opponent was very important for Gandhi. Thirdly, as we've discussed, Gandhi found the right issue, salt. Everyone needs salt, and everyone could see injustice in charging a tax for the use of salt, even from poor people. So he framed the issue very, very astutely. And that is what, what every campaign now has to do in order to gain um, public awareness. Fourthly, Gandhi very skillfully created an insoluble dilemma for the British. British Raj. If the British troops attacked and arrested Indian protesters who were making the assault, that action would arouse widespread opposition. But if they did not arrest the lawbreakers, they would see their authority undermined. There is no way out of this dilemma. 
And it was a very, very astute strategy on the part of Gandhi. Fifthly, and something we haven't really discussed very much, is that Gandhi combined political action, in this case, the Salt March, uh, and the attack on the um, government salt making facility, he combined that with community building activities. The latter included his emphasis on, on self-reliant communities where people work together to build a local economy, even, even by spinning their own wool. So I think all of those lessons are, are important today. Um, the last one is very important, uh, the idea of creating community uh, in the process of building uh, a movement based on self, based on nonviolence. Because today we are very much separated from one another, of course, by technology that we all peer into our individual screens, sometimes also by identities. So the question is how to overcome that separation, how to build solidarity for the larger struggles that affect us all. So our next session in two weeks considers another classic campaign that to achieve equality rights during the civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King in the US. So please do join us for that session as we expand our knowledge about how to win uh, wage winning campaigns. Well, that is all I have in the, in the form of wrap up. So thank you all very much for attending and I hope very much we'll see you again in two weeks and two weeks after that. And then we'll go on from there to build further sessions. Good night.